Well, welcome to our our talk. It's a it's a sequel. Yeah, I and sequels are always better, right? Isn't that the rule? <laughs> Maybe only one. All right. Um, so, I'm Andy Gospodarek. I'm at Broadcom. Yeah, I'm Jesper. I'm with Red Hat. Uh, obvious from the Red Hat. <laughs> That's right. So today we're gonna kind of continue our talk that we had uh, earlier this year. Uh, we talked about XTP and just talked about usability and how people can get involved. Uh, that talk is still available. We're not going to completely cover everything that we did there. We're going to talk about some new things because people like new stuff uh, and changes since then. Um, so like we said, the motivation is the follow-up from last time. Uh, we, we did get a little bit less time this time, so we'll right. focus on like the updates and we'll show you some new tools, try to get everybody into the ecosystem, right? Yeah, we're, and we're still really motiva motivated to try to demystify uh, XDP and uh, eBPF. By the way, eBPF, such a mouthful, we're just going to say BPF means the same thing. Um, but we want you to really understand how to consume uh, and understand th the technology because it is still at times a little confusing. Uh, though you can't like click this right now, um, there, this is a link to our YouTube talk. If you've got an hour uh, and can't sleep, it's great. Um, <laughs> show it to your friends and family. I'm sure we can get at least 200 views, views on YouTube. Um, so, uh, so today, what are we going to learn? Let's, let's talk about what, yeah, what yeah, you'll what, get out what of the presentation. What you will get out of this. This is sort of important for us to, that you actually get something out of this presentation. So let's, let's see. All right, so we'll kind of bring you up to date with uh, what's happened in XTP since then, uh, highlight some of the recent changes. Um, yeah, and we, we really want you to be like in the driver's seat for what we, we perceive as like this new uh, fast user programmable networking. Even Simon mentioned it in, in his slide that we are like the cool kids on the block and we have the old filter matching uh, uh, things. So, and yeah, we'll, we'll teach you about some of the new tools. And yeah, we'll see if we can you know, talk about some new ideas uh, for XDP and BPF use cases. Uh, maybe go a little bit beyond some of the distributed denial of service stuff uh, and load balancer use cases. Um, it's, not, it's not always that fun to just talk about how fast our application can drop packets. Um, <laughs> People have kept claimed that that, that, that we, are, we are really good at uh, dropping packets, right? We, we already know that, but we actually want to go a little bit beyond some, find some new use cases for this. That's right. <laughs> so, um, so what we're not going to learn, we're not going to talk about getting started with eBPF and XDP. Again, that's covered in the talk. Uh, we're not going to talk about the compiler tool chain that's there and that's great. We're not going to talk about the, the samples that are in the kernel tree right now and how they're split up, how the object, elf objects are split up or the loader, or um, you know, the right BPF syscalls. Yeah, and then, then we have all this that like Andy just covered, like we have the, the that, that we're not going to cover, like we have the kernel side, we have the user side, we have the <laughs> maps going in here, and have the BPF bytecode, we can modify the maps, we have the syscall, and, and we obviously stole this, uh, this, this, this drawing. So we, That's we right, so we're not gonna cover we any of this, we all right? So <laughs> watch, the, watch the video. Uh, we've explained it before, you can go, that's right. go watch it, right? Um, all right, so here we are, uh, sort of the new era in user programmable networking. Yeah, so we, we, we see this as a, a lower layer in, uh, in the network stack. This is basically how, how we perceive uh, XDP. So it's a programmable hook you can run before uh, we allocate the SKB. And we basically want you to use this new building block that, that we added for networking. Um, yeah, it's really, it operates at the same layer as other bypass solutions like the DBDK. Uh, in theory, it operates at basically the same speed with the goal being that we have a low number of CPU instructions that operate on a per packet basis. That's really the key to all this, is minimizing the number of instructions that, that, that are run on per packet. Uh, so we have raw access to the Ethernet frame. Uh, so it's before the SKBuff exists. So what we're saving is the allocation of the SKBuff metadata, essentially. Um, and it's... This is in, in the kernel tree right now. Uh, it's been in the Linux kernel since 4.8. Uh, lots of hardware drivers have support for it. Um, now, on the heels of the, the talk we had in April, uh, Dave uh, proposed and Dave sent patches for um, now generic XDP, so you don't have to have the full support in your driver for it if you want to write apps and test apps, and that was in 4.12. 12, yeah. So that's available now. Um, and the XDP programming language is eBPF. It's, it's, it's important to mention that eBPF is bigger than XDP, right. right? It's it's a complete uh, like complete compiler toolchain 
which we're not going to talk about. We promise that. Right. And <laughs> but but XDP is just one hook uh, that that you use for for invoking EBPF. And the real power actually comes from if you actually combine many of these hooks in the kernel, and you can do all kind of new uh, interesting stuff. And you always also have to wrap your head around that you can control this by by maps, and then your different programs can coordinate with each other through this 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 map, this shared state. So the the combination we we think the combination is really good because it's a combination of XTP and plus BPF that is that gives us this user programmable networking. Right. The the some of the restrictions that eBPF places on you are really good. I mean, we could have just you know, the kernel could have just created an area where you could plug in any random program. You know, I mean, we could have thought about creating a new kernel module infrastructure or something yeah, like that. Yeah, we could have loaded a new like standard C code in this hook, but some visionary people figured out that it was better to we try to load this BPF program there. We we get all the benefits of that, and uh, in, uh, that we can load this in a in a in a safe manner, without having allowing to to run direct C code and the other all the the programming errors that would crash the kernel there. We we now have BPF in this hook, which is pr provides uh, security and sandboxing. Uh, so the kernel is basically responsible just for moving the package package fast. This gave us this split. Now we have the BPS side. It's maximum flexibility. And uh, maybe you want to talk about that? Yeah. It, so so you end up with the ability to really do anything you want. Not anything you want, but a lot of different things to packets as they come in. Uh, and for example, if administrators want to quickly uh, make a change, uh, you don't have to upgrade a kernel. You can do it quickly. Um, you I, think can we, I think we talked about like you, you could do, you could, uh, for example, if you get the pack of death, that's something to do with, with, with with, with calling your network stack, we could drop the packet in XDP because this is before allocating the SKB, so we could drop security, drop security That's right. issues without uh, upgrading the kernel, right? That's right, and, and the great thing about this is you can only run, if you want to, you can just run the code you need for your specific use case. Um, so you're not accumulating a ton of, a ton of bloat over time, uh, and, and if, you have a if your use case changes, you can quickly make a change. Uh, the other great thing is this is in the kernel tree. So it's maintained by the Linux kernel, kernel community, supported by the kernel community, and uh, like we said, it, it swaps in and out very easily. So you're not necessarily required to bring down your interface and restart your polling operations, recompute everything. It's just one atomic swap operation, and your new program is up and running. So that's a, a huge advantage from a, an uptime. Uh, as, as anybody that's worked on had devices connected to routers and switches before, they, they know that having, having a port flap is Something that you know makes the folks yeah. in your knock uh, get a page, or yeah. you know, you don't like don't some like some that. sort of message that no one likes to hear about. So uh, things like that make make XDP pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. So so for for people that we have this sort of summary slide here, what XDP can do for you, and and so and I guess some people know it already, but let's just go over what what. What what the kind of facilities that that we are providing for you to 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 manipulate uh, these these uh, these packets? So XDP can can read and modify the packet content. It's quite quite strong, uh, powerful feature that you can modify it. We can push and pull headers of that. That's also a very powerful powerful feature. Yeah, I mean it's it sounds very basic, but the, the great advantage is for a variety of reasons. If you wanted to, for example, uh, if you had a new protocol coming in that was not necessarily supported by the Linux kernel, but you knew you could handle it, you could pop that header off. Uh, if you wanted to add a VLAN tag, you could do that. Remove a VLAN tag, you could do that. A uh, variety of different things that, that, that the more you think about the fact that this infrastructure is there, the more ideas you come up with that are, that are usable. Um, on top of that, uh, the, the primary interface is that you have a program that we've said that connects, and XTP has uh, five different action codes that are returned. Yeah, and the, the famous one is drop, right? We have for That's the, right. so the fast. DDoS protection uh, feature, which Facebook, Facebook have, have deployed, and others are, are also looking at. And then, then, then we have the pass. It's, it's people like the pass operation is just passing this, this to, the, to the normal kernel stack. But it's quite Im important to understand that we actually have a powerful feature here because we could push push or pull headers and we can actually modify the packet before it reaches the network stack. That means we could actually change the flow uh, from from 
for, 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 for controlling something, right? Yeah, and built in by default with, with this solution, XTP pass means that you're not separated from the rest of the kernel stack. I mean, this is inline operating there. I mean, other, you know, high-speed data plane development kits, you know, uh, aren't necessarily always connected to the kernel stack. Yeah, so, so that's some are, some one of these the huge advantages. Some of these ideas came out of that, that Cloudflare told me they had a bypass solution that they, they needed to re-inject packets into the kernel. And I was like, why do you have to re-inject it? Why don't you fill it in line? And that was one of the reasons we created this infrastructure. That's right. And now they have talked heavily about usage of, of XDP at this point. Yes. They're, they're in the fold. All right, so the other option is XDPTX, uh, which allows you to, like we said, we've already talked about modify, push and pull headers, make changes, swap MAC addresses, uh, but you can send packets out the same interface. Uh, drop, pass, uh, TX, and aborted these first four operations with the main, the main ones created when it was added to the kernel tree to start with. Um, one might wonder why would you want to just transmit it out, but there is definitely uh, the load balance use case or plenty of other use cases where yeah. you have other opportunities at your hardware this, level. This, to this one is the also used by, by Facebook for their load balancer. That's right. So they were the primary motivation they wanted this in before we got the redirect. Uh, so yeah, then we have um, aborted, uh, which really is uh, essentially the same as drop. Uh, that'll be the action that happens, your packet's dropped, but it gives you this great opportunity to uh, catch this condition and modify it. Uh, we actually have an example later. We talk a little bit about the, the power of abort. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so, so the idea with abort that in your programming you could say, well, this this sh uh, situation should not happen. I want to drop the packet, but I, I'm calling tr uh, abort instead because that allows me later to attach a trace point to see and debug my program if any any packets hit this this code path, so I can I, I can catch that. And then we have the the new kit on the block since last the redirect where you can transmit or steer packets out uh, another NIC. But the really powerful thing we're going to talk about is that we can you can do steering by maps, and I think we'll. Save a little bit for the later slides. Teaser. That's a teaser for yeah. later. Pay attention. <laughs> all right. Uh, and all BPF programs, as we mentioned, interact um, uh, or interact via helper functions um, that can look up and modify kernel state. And again, this is kind of a tightly constrained and controlled environment. You can't just call any kernel function you want. Um, and that's, you know, in a lot of ways, a good thing. Um, and also, there are uh, shared maps to user space that other BPF programs can use to track state. Uh, and, and this is, this is the pr as we mentioned, the primary communication mechanism. So the BPF program comes up. It has maps that it's going to look at uh, that contain, that are, uh, we're not going to go into all the details of the types of maps. No. We covered that in the but last you talk. You have to change your program model a little bit but to use, yeah, use these it's, maps. Yeah, it's a little right? bit of a, of a shift, but it works really well, and it's a, a safe way to uh, interact. Yeah, so, so we wanted to design this to cooperate with normal network stack, yeah? Like I think maybe yeah, I mean we sort of covered this. It should be pretty obvious at this point that this is not a bypass solution. This is an inline work with the kernel stack. Um, so we can teach the kernel things it doesn't know yet, uh, make new changes without upgrading the kernel. We've talked to plenty of people who've talked about the BPF and XDP use cases where uh, not needing to update the kernel or reboot the box is extremely important. Um, so on, on the receive side, um, we're capable of it. You know, we talked about adjusting packet headers. Uh, Maybe we could steer to a VLAN device, steer somewhere else. Um, we also now, there's a new feature um, that was just added to add some metadata into, into the buffer that we pass around. And maybe that could be used a little bit later uh, by other programs. Uh, it's, there are some use cases for it right now. Yeah, um, yeah on, uh, and, and on when you want to transmit the packet back, so like on receive, we adjusted the packet headers. It could be like some kind of new encapsulation that the kernel doesn't know about. We can cut that off and put it into a, for example, a VLAN. On the transmit side, we could add another BPF program to, to, to re-encapsulate and put this back on, on, the, on the SKB in this case. And, and when, when we're transmitting it out, and there are many, there's actually many options. You can, like you can look into traffic control, the socket filter, and you can restore it based on information from the map or the VLAN device. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility in this uh, programming model of, of interacting with the network stack that pe most people don't realize, I think. That's what we're trying to... Yeah, and, and so it is, you know, in this case, you are, you are writing separate programs, for example. You're going to have one that's going to handle Rx and one that's going to handle Tx, which is a little bit different than if you're familiar with other, other uh, existing uh, technologies. But the real, where the real power comes from combining more of these hooks together. That's right. All right, so where do we start? How would you get going if you want to actually get involved in the XTP ecosystem? 
All right, so we're not going to talk about all these mailing lists, but here they are. It's a great reference slide, and we're sure these slides will appear online later. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there's a question that someone posted to XTP Newbies this morning. Uh, if you want to get involved and answer the question yeah. pretty yeah, quick. Someone should like to answer it, maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Anyone. Uh, if not, someone will get to it later. We've also got uh, great documentation. Jesper's uh, been... I would, I would say I would, I would, I'm, I'm going to update it. It's going to be improved. Okay, we'll, we'll, okay just documentation process. then. We'll remove it. <laughs> we'll update uh, it. Uh, hopefully, uh, <laughs> I'll integrate this in, into the kernel doc. But Daniel actually wrote a pretty good guide, uh, which is published on the, on the Decilium uh, website. Absolutely. All right, so recent changes of interest. Since, since April, uh, there's actually been quite a bit going on. Uh, so we're going to talk about sort of a constrained subset of those changes, a small set. Um, yeah, so we're, mo we're mostly going to cover like introspection, uh, which is was something that people brought up and we have addressed. Um, yeah, for a long time, I think the the samples that exist in the kernel tree right now uh, seem a little bit like magical. Uh, it's not really clear how you might expand on those to write your own program. Uh, you can run them; it's pretty easy to run. Um, but they're not super functional. So yeah, people talk wanted, about wanted to know what's running on my system. And right. How, how do we know? You know, what if you you were running it? It's an interactive app, and then you change to another window, things like that. So, um, so Martin and uh, Jakob's changes are highlighted here pretty heavily. So we've got um, as of uh, well, right now, um, four thirteen uh, BPF IDs for loaded programs and maps are available. This gives us some introspection. Uh, you can dump those from user space. You can take a look at them. The great thing is this was a BPF tool was, was created uh, and is now part of the kernel tree as well, I think as of like basically a month or so ago. Yeah. Um, and you can start to inspect these objects. So if you want to, we'll have an example in a little bit. Um, but it's easy to list programs that are loaded, XDP programs or BPF programs. Yeah, um, and, and you might actually, actually get like a little surprise when you, when you do that, actually, because today OpenSSH and even just if you're do using Docker are loading BPF programs, you just don't know it, uh, but they're actually getting, getting used in real life. That's right. And then, then, then we have uh, XDP monitor, which is based on just using trace points. It's not using XDP itself. It's just monitoring what XDP is doing. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a tool to help debug what's going on, and we have a, an example later. Okay, so here's the first first little example: IP link, IP route two also had some changes. So uh, we know we know this one time. over here. Yeah, that's right. The, with the with the XDP that we can see that, but now we also get out, output with the, the the ID number. And what what can we use this ID number for? What what can we use the ID number for? It's on the next. Oh slide. yeah, the next slide. <laughs> uh, uh, well, oh, did it we skip? It's, it's no, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get back to the Sorry, we'll four. get back. Yeah, sorry. Pay attention to the, 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 four, the highlighting was added by us. So pay attention to that four in the program ID and the fact that the XTP is there. Um, but yeah, we're going we're gonna to use this to inspect a little bit in a few minutes. So BPF tool. Uh, didn't really need to make this like a display of the man page or anything, but we figured we'll just quickly show that the, the main operations are program operations and map operations. Uh, the, yeah. Oh, yes, we want to say something. No, it's just tell. that the up the, the, the two main objects are map and program. That's right. Uh, so that you can perform all these operations uh, on maps. Um, we'll take a look at a, a use case for what in a minute. And then you can identify these maps in, in various ways. Um, this tool is great. Um, you can also look at the programs that are running. Uh, you can look at ver just various data that we've currently implemented we, the kernel community, and, and that this tool is able to read. Yeah, um, you, you can dump, dump the, like the... Right, the you can dump code. the program code, which is a request from a long time ago. Like, how do I see what's running? How do I know what this, what this code looks like? Um, all right, so tie this back into what we did before. This yes, was a program so that yeah. uh, was written essentially for the, the discussion or for the presentation in April. Um, this is a blacklist program um, that, that it's, it's, it's sort of a task for, for, for you, right? So right. I, lo I load this program. You don't know what's going on. And you can see uh, I've, I've loaded several maps here, and we've highlighted some information right. on here that um, I'll, I'll ask uh, Andy, Andy to figure out if you can ex extract back, right? That's right. Okay, so we know that, that these maps are here, which means there's a, they're actually pinned to files, which means we also know there are file descriptors associated with these. And we added to the blacklist uh, this IP address at some point, both of these. So, so now we can run BPF program show and see what we have. So we now see that we've got um, this one program running. I don't know if you remember oh, the four from four. a few slides earlier. Um, it's now green. 
And uh, this tag is a hash uh, computed by the kernel, so it gives us a unique identifier for our program. Um, we know when it was loaded, we know the user that loaded it, we know the, s the sizes, and we know that these are the five IDs that are associated with the BPF maps. So now I say, great, show me all the BPF maps that, are, that exist on this, on this uh, one. And here we go, unsurprisingly, five, six, seven, eight, nine correspond to these numbers here. And we've got these different, we can see there's a hash and, a, and four arrays. How many entries, and we even see how may, much memory. Right, we can see the memory usage, um, how many, the maximum number of entries. And we, we, um, we have to, this big hash to, to make sure matching against the IP, IPs we want to block, because this was the denial of service protection program that just filters uh, a lot of IP addresses. That's right. So, so now we're going to take a look at the map five to see if we can see what's in there and understand if the, the value we thought was there is there. And we see that um, the only element in this map happens to be happens to have this key C six twelve thirty two zero three. Which boy, that sounds really familiar. And um, this, this is a C per CPU map, so that's why the CPU shows up. Correct. This is an eight-core system, and this is technically a counter. So if this program were running and we were getting a lot of traffic destined for IP address 198.18.50.3, what we would see is every time a core that was processing this frame received a frame with this IP address, we'd see this value increment in this counter. So this is nice. If we didn't have uh, this here, we'd have to run some other program, or this is a great way to see hey, is my program that's supposed to read this map actually outputting the correct data? Previous to this, there wasn't really a great option to do that. You're just sort of hoping. Uh, and that's not always a great strategy. Um, also, we could take the same map. You can dump it now with uh, JSON support. Thanks to Quentin for that. Um, and if you're not sure if that's quite readable, there's even a pretty output. Uh, makes it much better. So this, this makes it so you can use this as a front end for a programming interface rather than having to constantly yeah, and, and you now you have the key. It's, it's a little bit funny that we have the keys split out in this way, but it makes it... It works, and it's pretty common. Uh, everything's sort of split up into chunks of that size uh, with this tool, so it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's way better than we had in the past, so this is awesome. Uh, the JSON output is also cool because it gives us the opportunity to change this output pretty easily. We feel pretty confident if you want to program, again, you know, re write programs to read the output, you just use JSON and you're done. So then... Kind of an example, I went and loaded, crazy, I know, another XDP program on another interface. And so now, uh, the highlighted in yellow showed up. So we've got, you know, a new program, an ID of eight. Obviously a new tag that was computed. We know it was loaded just a little bit later. Um, uh, or exactly eight hours later, apparently. Um, and uh, we now know that there's a map IDs 14 associated with, there, one, one map ID 14 associated with it. So I want to check that out. And uh, oh, by the way, you, if you if you recognize this, you might realize this is uh, this should be XDP two that was run from the kernel source tree, and uh, and so now and we can see in, in the newer kernels it has this. You can right. actually get the name out of. Yeah, after. how cool is that? So that's actually the name of the map. Um, so that's a pretty nice feature as well. Um, I think the program I was running earlier was actually compiled previously, so the name wasn't there. Kind of an older libbpf. Kind of an example of how fast this stuff is moving, um, which is great. Um, and I don't think I did a, a dump of that. Nope. Um, but that's, that, and again, this is just a great debugging tool. This is kind of the availability and serviceability that something like XDP needs. All right. Yeah, so this is, this is the XDP monitor. As a, we can use this as a debugging tool to see what's going on. And in this case, I, I misconfigured something. I'm, I'm, I'm using the, the XDP redirect action, and I, I'm actually redirecting to to a CPU that doesn't exist. So I'm I'm in my program. I'm calling a it or getting a it. So I'm 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 counting that. And 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 at, at the same time, there's also some successful things going on. This is a uh, this is uh, like a just a TCP. Uh, uh, what what was called this this test where we're, where we're just creating TCP connections back and forth. So we're actually creating like thirty two thousand. Connections per sec, per TCP connections per second in this th this test, and at the same time we are we are basically dropping uh, 13 million packets per second, and this this is this is fine, easy right? Uh, so, but the, the program that was actually running in my program it my itself actually detected the situation in red over there. that I'm using a wrong destination CPU, fine. But I also loaded in my program that I'm watching for exceptions. 
Uh, so I, I'm actually seeing that the, the exemptions in 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 the program itself here. So I'm I'm catching yeah. So I, d I didn't need, need to use the uh, the monitor tool because I actually chose to also also implement this in my own program to monitor this the error states. You can of course do that. All right, so these are great tools so far. Uh, but as always, uh, whenever people love to point out problems with them, uh, we'll say patches are accepted. Uh, so I think there's a ton of options. Uh, you know, as, as Jesper mentioned, maybe some more ways to do some, some better printing, some better decoding of the values stored in maps. Uh, there are specifically some uh, maps that are targeted at IP addresses. So boy, it sure would be great if those were just printed out as IP addresses. Um, also, inspecting BPF programs before they're loaded. Um, it'd be great to be able to actually have a ELF binary sitting on your system and check the tag on that, compare that to the tag of the one that's running. You should feel pretty confident that the, the one that's running is the one you think. Um, you could also do some accumulation of results in per-CPU maps because, as we've both noted, it's kind of a pain to add that up uh, over and over again, um, especially when you're using a counter that's across multiple CPUs. Yeah. <coughs> And the, it was the XTP monitor was was mostly as a, so you can see examples. But I could like if you want to bring make it usable, like have maybe also have JSON output. That seems to like to be a popular thing, right? Uh, and and maybe have a like a one shot option where just I, I'm outputting the the stats, and I could use that and com combine with the JSON output and pipe that into to uh, to, to to something that that will display it in a smarter way, right? And then basically you can monitor it in. in in a fancy manner. So one of the great things and exciting things I think about XDP and, and, and these tools in particular is there's plenty of room for improvement. So if you're looking for something to do and you're not sure how to get involved, we hope you'll yeah. be I think encouraged have, by this. I think this we have to move along with the slides. But we do, yeah, okay, all right. So uh, the recent, some, some recent change, that's we, we added a way to transfer metadata. So it's basically, this, this is Daniel's patch. Uh, it's a very recent patch, but it's sort of important. Po maybe people don't realize how important it, it is, but it's a generic way to 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 transfer some metadata information that get transferred to that can be used by other BPF programs. For example, the TC hook, and that sort of creates a communication channel, uh, and it's it's implemented in a in a generic way, which is really nice. And it's part of the the the, the packet headroom. Um, you could you could use this to like extract different information from the, you choose something in the XTP program, put it in the metadata. We, we have a attach another a BPF hook at the TC layer, which will then extract the information. At this point, we have created the SKP, and we can now put a mark on the SKP based on some information we, 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 uh, we found in the XTP program. So, yeah. We probably, and we probably better get rolling. I hate yeah. to do that. But, uh, so yeah, and XTP redirect is the new return code since the last one. So this is a great opportunity to send packets between two interfaces. In the past, it was just send it out the one it came in, which at times uh, doesn't seem quite as useful as being able to redirect to another interface. Yeah. Or, as Jesper commented earlier, being able yeah. to redirect uh, via a map is yeah, extremely that's, that's powerful. I, I want important. to highlight that the innovative part is using maps to redirect, because that means we this hopefully the last return code in the drivers. We don't have to touch the drivers if we want to do a new type of redirection because we, we can just introduce a new map that does this redirection. So I found that quite innovative. It's, it's not very obvious from, from sort of the implementation, but this redirect via maps actually give us the ability to do receive bulking because we have implemented, we have a flush operation after the NAPI poll is done, which basically allow us to implement like adaptive uh, bulking and without introducing additional latency, so we we, we are just piggybacking on, on the on the normal uh, uh, NAPI, NAPI uh, system in the in the Linux kernel, where where we are adaptively turning on polling mode and and disabling interrupts, and and this way has been working great since. You want so to the yes. Next slide? So yeah, we. The well-known use cases we talked about, DDoS, load balancer, uh, forwarding between containers, uh, the, like Cilium use case, or rapidly prototyping uh, new, proto new protocol extensions. Uh, but also there's all kinds of crazy things that are maybe are unknown to the kernel. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing that, yes, we talked about, and we know we're almost out of time, uh, feels like this is an Oscar speech, um, and XTP redirect um, via CPU maps is really cool. I think we should probably... Yeah, we just keep this one. We just keep rolling, yeah. Um, also, um, 
there was, there was a cool patch uh, on, the, on the mailing list where you actually right. offload routing. You, you have the normal routing system in the Linux kernel, the rou normal routing tables, but you offload the routing to HTTP and use the existing setup, but just route and optimize the performance reader rates. I think... What's oh, what I think that's fast. I don't think that's accurate. We, 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 we start a little bit before, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are out of time, yeah, uh, as, that's, that's as we guessed. That's a good cue for the slide. Right? That's right. Um, so you can read the summary slides, but... Yeah. But I, I think we have a few seconds left, right? Yeah, so we have... The, we want to highlight that this is an in-kernel solution for, for FastPath, right? And we are, we are getting programmable networking inside the Linux network stack. There's really powerful features we're adding here. And we think it'll be lower maintenance and deployment, and it doesn't take over your NIC, so it's a shared yeah. resource. Yeah, um, it doesn't take over NIC. We, we get very fine granularity. You get granularity at the programming level, what you, what you want to do, like DBDK takes over the entire NIC. We are, we are providing the maximum flexibility. And we and yeah, we can't, we can't have a slide without thanks. There's a ton of people that made this happen, uh, and we'd love to have a ton more. No, thank you. Okay. you. You can see these guys at the cloud bar tonight. They, they'll share a drink with you and talk XTP. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Andy, yeah. have you got one of these already? No. You, you got one? Are we out of time for no questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do we have time for questions? Okay, you can get a question. Oh, we have one. one question. So, is it possible to do a XTP network redirect to something that doesn't run Nappy, say IFB? To do a redirect to I didn't I didn't get that the, the IFB. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. But it, <laughs> but but XTP works on, on on ingress already. So. Yeah, but I I think Celium is actually already doing that. They're loading a hook in the in the in the ingress hook out of TC. So they I think they're actually doing that already. Yeah. All right. It's software. All things are possible, right? Go share a drink with these guys at Cloudbar. Public service announcement. Beer. Beer. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah.